523. M number 523. Brother, please ask 
bless all the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for being our Redeemer, and we are your Redeemer. Thank you, Lord, that you have purchased us, and we belong to you, and you will not leave us nor forsake us, and nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you, Lord, for your all-sufficient grace. We pray, Lord, as we hear the preaching of your word, you will help us to align our hearts with your word and with your will. Help us, Lord, to take what we hear and apply it to our lives and share it with us. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We pray, Lord, if there's one among us that does not know of your salvation today, be the day they come to know you as their Savior. Pray, Lord, that all we do and say here today will bring honor and glory to you. We ask, Lord, you'll take this offering, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mary. Amen. song this morning. We're going to be at hymn number 105 if y'all want to follow along. together turn over to hymn number 278 278 
415. Room number 415, and after the first verse, the choir will come down and we'll go around and greet each other, welcome each other to the house of the Lord this morning.
Y'all would turn over one more. Hymn number 247. Hymn number 247. Thank you. you. May be seated. Savior said, whosoever will may come. He paid all our debts on Calvary. I still rejoice when I remember that whosoever will meant me. One day I prayed, in that moment he answered. I wasted so many days trying to find my joy alone. When I saw his love, that he so freely gave i trusted my life to him 
Yes, one day I prayed. My Savior said, I am with you always. You will never leave nor forsake. When I'm feeling weak or abandoned, it's in his precious name that I can pray. Because one day I pray, in that moment he answered. I wasted so many days trying to find my joy alone when I need his love that he so freely gave. I can fall on my knees again because one day I pray. My Savior said, there ye may be also. As he foretold the coming for his bride, he said, my heart should not be troubled. For as his child, I will be glorified because one day I pray. And in that moment, he answered. I wasted so many days trying to find my joy alone. When I saw his son and the blood he so freely gave, I fall on my knees again because one day I prayed. Yes, I can call out to my father because one day I prayed. Amen. I hope you have a day that you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. You'll never get over his love. If you would, I invite you to take your Bibles this morning and go to Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37. <clears throat> you know, the Word of God has the answer for everything that we go through, and all the details, all the events of our lives. Sometimes we look at the time that we're in in a day like today, and we automatically want to go to the book of Revelation and, and uh, see some of the things that's going to come to pass and, and things of that nature. But uh, I can tell you, you, as you start gaining something of the character of our Savior and what it is that has been established, you'll find uh, His comfort and His direction all through the pages of Scripture. And we'll see that here today in Genesis 37. If you're able, I'll invite you to stand with me one more time <clears throat> this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word. Genesis 37. And uh, we, we're going to go down to verse number 12 is where we're going to pick up. And we're looking at uh, the account of Joseph. And uh, Joseph, his, his life is about to transform. He's, he's already gotten his coat of many colors that you've probably heard about and, and uh, seen some favor, favoritism that is shown to him by his father. And now he's, he's going to be sending, the father's going to be sending Joseph to uh, check on his brethren and the flocks. And, and, uh, and they are not on good terms. And uh, so uh, there is a plot that's levied against him. That's where we're going to be looking at <clears throat> today. In Genesis 37, verse number 12 says, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy uh, brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? 
And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him... Uh, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that, uh, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him of his father again. I want to bring our message of remembering the one who called you. Remember the one who called you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for your love for us, the blessings that you extend. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us the freedom to be able to gather here this morning, to be encouraged in the Word of God, to be able to know that you have the answers for all things of our nation, of our homes, of us individually. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would continue to meet needs and that you would draw us close to yourself. Help us, Lord, to be able to honor you with every decision. Lord, we pray, Father, that you would help us to be able to give our undivided attention to you and to the direction of your word. We just want to thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do be seated. You know, the whole world is watching the things that are unfolding right now uh, in Israel. Uh, all the major players are starting to come into the pictures. And there's China and there's Iran and Russia and uh, Israel and the U.S. And, and it seems like every nation, every country is just kind of formulating their responses. And it's like the chess, uh, chess movement and laying things out about what's going to take place. Uh, we start looking at our own nation. Of course, that's where it hits home the most, I guess, because it's personal. And we start seeing there's a lot of political uncertainties that are taking place in our own nation. There's a lot of division that we see. The conservative party can't get their act together. The leader of our nation seems kind of uh, mentally unstable. Uh, everybody's kind of out for their own interest. You know, there's a lot of things that's going on that, that all of that goes into the decisions and the directions that are made. Many people are asking, what is the course of action that we're to take as the children of God? A lot of times people, we look at this and we, we recognize the thing, the kind of the handwriting on the wall, certainly the, uh, the potential for, uh, for fulfilling things in a biblical uh, prof prophetic standpoint. And, and yet we have to look and say, well, what about us? What are, we, what are we supposed to do as God's children? And it's times like these that we need to remember where it is that we actually have our allegiance. Amen. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. And he says that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The truth is we are often faced with reminders that the Lord is going to return. Amen. Uh, he's true to his word and his word has the answers that we need. And that's the direction that we need to take. We say, what are we supposed to do? Well, uh, we're supposed to be doing what God called us to do. Amen. Uh, Peter addressed it in his day in 2 Peter 3 and verse 11. He says, seeing then that, that all these things shall be dissolved. Uh, it's pretty interesting, amen? Uh, we start looking at it, guess what? It, there's worlds of temporary basis, amen? He says one day it's going to be dissolved, and then he asks the great question, what manner of persons ought ye to be? And all holy conversation and godliness. You know, the more that we look around and we, uh, we see the writing on the wall per se, and we, we look at the events, what's taking place, and we say, what are we supposed to do? And God says, that's right, what is it that you're supposed to do? What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness. I was thinking about that matter whenever I was reading this account of Joseph this week and just seeing just how uh, needed it is. As you, as you look at the passage, the main interest, it, it's really on the brothers. Uh, as you go on through the, the chapter, I mean, the brothers, they're conspiring. The brothers, uh, they're, they're looking at the pit. They're, de they're determining where he's going to be thrown a little bit later on. Uh, you know, they, 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 there's the big discussion that they have that's going on about, I uh, say, so, well, let's just kill him, you know. And, and then Reuben stands in. Imagine Reuben's your, your help, you know. And he says, no, 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 no. He said, we, we don't need that guilt on us. Let's throw him in a pit instead. And, and then here comes a party that's coming by. They said, well, let's sell him as a slave. We'll get some money out of it. We'll, yeah, we'll We'll be free of him. We'll lie to dad. We'll, we'll take that coat that he loves and we'll dip it in blood and take it back to him. And, and, and you know, we'll just let him uh, think that, you know, a wild animal just tore him to shreds. Have you ever thought about just how disturbing that is? I mean, that's pretty out there, isn't it? Can you imagine going back to your daddy and saying that about your sibling? I mean, even if you don't like your sibling. 
Amen. Man, that's, that's pretty rough. And, and yet those are the things that are taking place. And so we look at it and a lot of the passage has to do with the brothers. The main interest is on them. And yet the actions of Joseph at this particular time, the things that's happening all around him, the actions of Joseph is going to set the very pattern and course of his life. Today, there's Again, there's this huge emphasis that's placed upon uh, Israel and the surrounding nations and everything in the Middle East. And you're looking at this nation and that nation and all their, uh, all their positions. But the decision that you and I have to make at this time will also have a defining effect for the rest of our lives. Amen. It's not just a matter of looking at the nations. It's not our job, honestly, to overanalyze the events. There will be plenty of people that are very prophetically minded and they'll go through and they'll establish all number of things and, and try to assign a prophetic per perspective to it and they can overanalyze all the events. But to simply be faithful, that's what it is that God calls for us to do. Amen. You want to know what to do? Be faithful with our responsibility. It seems like things are lining up for the end of the church age and I believe that it is. But can I tell you, that's not to be the main interest. Uh, listen, if we're still here talking about it in 20 years, guess what? It hadn't changed the direction that God has for us. When the disciples asked Jesus, remember he was, uh, he was going to be leaving in Acts chapter 1, and, and uh, as he was ascending out there, the, the disciples were talking to Jesus, and they said, well, uh, what are going to be the, uh, the signs there of setting up your kingdom? What are we looking for whenever you're going to set up your kingdom? And he said, in Acts 1 and verse number 7, he says, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. What was he telling him? He said, be faithful, be faithful. It's great to know that whenever the time is drawing near, in the day that we're in, we're looking at it and saying, man, think this is it. Can I go ahead and tell you the time has always been drawing near? Amen. Amen. If you knew that the Lord was going to come tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, if you knew that was going to be the day, uh, that was going to be the time, it should not affect what it is that you're doing right now today. Amen. If it would, then you're living in disobedience to God. Uh -huh. We're supposed to be faithful to God every day the same. The life of Joseph takes a, a lot of time to be able to go through, and we're not certainly going to go through it all, but I'd like for us to see just a few of the details of how he remained faithful to fill the great responsibility that was given to him in troubling times. Much of the extra events around his life, they, honestly, it's going to sound familiar to us if you start looking at it. It's going to sound a lot like what we have. They, uh, we look at our nation, we look at our country and, and world, and, and, and there's a lot of division there. Can I tell you, Joseph knew something about division. Whenever you look at his family, it was all about division. Joseph's home was divided. His father was Jacob, who was uh, later given the name of Israel. And uh, Jacob had married Rachel and Leah, remember that? And uh, besides that, he also had kids with the handmaids, Bilhah and Zilpah. You know, amazingly enough, that didn't work well. You know, uh, it seemed like there was a lot of problem, a lot of contention that was going on, a lot of animosity, a lot of favor that was being shown in the, in the home and in the family. Early on, uh, you remember Jacob, he loved Rachel and he tolerated Leah. You know, he got duped into Leah. He had to serve seven years for Rachel. Uh, come to find out next morning after the wedding night, he finds out that he had married Leah instead. And he's like, what are you doing to me? Talk to his father-in-law. He said, well, it's not right. You know, she's older got to serve another seven years for the one that you wanted. All right. So he served another seven years, already contention in the home. Verse three says that, that uh, uh, if you look at it real quick in our, in our chapter, he says, now Israel, talking about Jacob there, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Jacob loved Joseph more than the rest of the kids. That favoritism drove a wedge in their relationship. It divided their home. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 25, that every city or, or house divided against itself shall not stand. He said, you can't have that kind of favoritism. So there was, uh, there was division in Joseph's home. Joseph understood something about that matter of division. He also knew about ungodliness. Amen. He knew about the things that go, went on in the world around him. They dwelt in the land of Canaan. In that time, that was a place of idolatry. It was a place that was very worldly. And the repercussions of living in that ungodly place began showing up. Can I tell you, uh, any time that you allow the things of an ungodly world to take a presence in your, uh, in your home and in your life, in the direction, in your eyes, your ears, the things that you look on, the things that you listen to, won't be long. It's going to have an intense direction in your life. Amen. It's going to have a prevailing effect in your home. Amen. 
Try it one more time. Uh, whenever you have ungodliness in your home, you're looking on things that are ungodly. You're listening to things that are ungodly. It's going to have a presence in your home. Amen. 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 Listen, it's one thing to be able to consider uh, the, the blessings of God and the love of God, but we cannot forget there's an outside world that is trying to corrupt the very walk that you have for the cause of Christ. I'll tell you, Joseph knew something about that. He knew what uh, Canaan was all about at the time. He knew about the idolatry that was there. I thought Canaan land was supposed to be the song of blessing. I thought that was what, what we were supposed to No, that, that was through Moses, amen. Uh, that was whenever he was, uh, deli- or uh, Joshua officially, but, but that was whenever God was going to go in there and cleanse that area. At this time, this was a, an idolatrous place. This was the place that, that, that Abraham would just kind of pass through. He would just kind of sojourn there. He wasn't laying up stock there, and yet uh, that was the repercussions of an ungodly place all around in this divide, now think about this, uh, you start putting it all together. Here's Joseph, amen. In this divided people, in an ungodly place, here's Joseph. Faithful. Faithful. Joseph would ultimately deliver God's people. Yeah. If you go through and you, you look at his whole life, that's exactly what it is that God was setting him up to do. Uh, he would go through some trials. He would go through some intensely difficult times. But God was going to use him if he would just remain faithful. And can I tell you, uh, God will use his church today in an ungodly and divided country in a divided time that we're in if we will just remain faithful to God. Amen. If we'll just use these lessons that, that we see through the life of Joseph, if we'll make the pr- practical application and say it's not just a Bible story, this is how it is that God equips his people and this is what it is that God wants for us. In this season that we're in, I'll give you just a couple of things. First off, be present. Be present. Look at what he says, verse number 12. It says, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. If you're ever looking for a theme a uh, theme phrase, I'll say, a theme verse, but a theme phrase in the, in the Bible that will help you in your life. Verse number 13 has a good one. What does it say in verse number 13? Here am I. That's a good phrase to live by, amen? You know, I started going through and, and I was just thinking about the number of people that used that phrase and, and saw how much of a blessing it was for somebody that was just available, somebody that was just present for the things of God. Whenever it says, uh, here am I, you know, it, it worked pretty well for Joseph. Amen. He looked at and said, no, he went through some trials. He delivered his people. Amen. You know, it worked for Samuel as a child. God was talking to to Samuel. Here am I. That was his response. Here am I. It'd be good for us at an early age to be able to say that same thing. Here am I. God, is that what you want? Here am I. I'm not going to wait and play out the, uh, play out the direction here. Wanna, don't want to look and see who it is that's going to pay me the most money. I just want to be available for God. It worked for Samuel work for Isaiah, whenever he was looking for a man to stand in the gap, a man that he would be able to send, a man that would be able to make a difference, he said, here am I. Can I tell you that phrase will work for you too? Amen. Amen. When Joseph received direction from the father, he presented himself immediately. Here's the father. He says, I "I got a job for you. Here am I. He wasn't hiding from the work that the father had for him to do. You know, there are times that Joseph is, uh, it's interesting whenever you start, if you ever read biographies and things like that, and uh, um, uh, commentators and, and that kind of thing, whenever they start looking at Joseph, there's a lot of ways that they'll often paint Joseph. Sometimes he, uh, they present him as being uh, oblivious to the ill will that was directed toward him. You know, he's just kind of blind. Hey, brothers, how y'all? No, he knows what's going on. Right. Hey, hey, listen, uh, if somebody hates you, I think you know it. Amen? <laughs> he wasn't oblivious. There are those that present Joseph as being smug and prideful whenever he would share his dreams with his family. They say, well, you know, Joseph was in the wrong. He was talking about his visions and the things that God gave, and he was boasting. That's not what it says at all. That's not at all. Matter of fact, go back uh, to verse number five. Let's look at it real quick. This is what was really spurring on the brothers here. This is what was really getting them. Verse number five, Joseph dreamed a dream. 
And he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. By the way, while we're on this subject, God does not work through dreams and visions anymore. We have the completed Word of God. You want to know what God has to say? It's going to come through the Word of God. Amen? Different time. But this is the way he was doing. He spoke to him, and he dreamed a dream, and he told it to the brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Verse number 6, he said unto them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood around about, and made obeisance to my sheep. And they, uh, the brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. He says, We were, we were harvesting wheat. He says, Mine, uh, mine was exalted. All, of the, uh, all you other guys, y'all just fell down is what he's telling them. He says, I, one day, he says, I just wanted to tell you, I got this dream where I was lifted up, and you're all bowing down to me. And it said, they hated him for that. Now, it goes on, verse number 9, it says, he dreamed yet another dream. Now, I don't know about you, but right, right about here, I think Joseph would be saying, oh, man. Uh, you know, 11 to 1, you know. <laughs> but, but yet, he's got this dream, and he told it, his brethren. Now, if you look in verse number 8, right there at the end, it says, they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So he said, uh, we hate him for the aspect of this is what the dream is, but we even hate him because he's talking about it. So now he's got another dream, and guess what he's going to do? Told it to his brethren. Verse number 9, he said, uh, behold, I've dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven star made, made obeisance to me, and he told it to his father and to his brethren, and and the father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? He's talking about these dreams, and, and he's saying, you know, he was the one that's lifted up, and not just the brothers falling down and worshiping, but, but he says, even his mother and father. Now, here's the thing. He wasn't being prideful. He wasn't being prideful, but how do you know? God never reprimanded him for it. In that day, if you had a vision, if you had a dream from God, it was the responsibility that you had to be able to share what it was that God had given you. What was he doing? He was being faithful with what it was that God had given him. It wasn't something where he was trying to exalt himself. He was just relaying the message. Uh, he, wasn't, uh, he, uh, he was also not ignorant about what the brothers thought about him. Amen? Uh, listen, I guarantee you every time that he says, I had a, had a dream. I don't think he was like, gather around, guys, I got another one. I don't think so. He knew his brothers hated him. He knew that he was going to, or not going to be well received at all. He knew that he was outnumbered. Amen. But when the father called, he responded. He responded. He knew the territory that he was hated. You know, interestingly enough, as much as he could look at the brothers, and he says, uh, man, the, the brothers hate me. They don't like to see me coming. They hate me. They, they don't like the dreams. They don't like the word of God. They don't like me. But he still knew that he was loved by the Father. You know, as we have a, a message from, from the Lord of the Word of God that we're supposed to be sharing with the lost world, guess what? There's going to be people that don't appreciate it. They're not going to like you. They didn't like Jesus. They don't like the Word of God. They don't like what it is that you stand for. They don't want to even want to hear what it is that you've got to say. They don't want to hear about the love of God for them. But you have a Father who loves you Amen. and gave you a great purpose. He knew the territory that he was headed. Now verse number 14 says that Joseph was instructed he was supposed to leave Hebron and go to Shechem. So well, that doesn't mean a lot to us, amen? Uh, if it's not in Texas, we don't really know where it is and don't really even care, amen? But, but think about what it is. It's this valley that was there. He's, he's got to leave he, uh, Hebron. He's going to go to Shechem. But again, the, the words in Scripture, those names, they meant something. Hebron, the name means fellowship. He was going to have to leave that, that valley of fellowship. And he was going to go to Shechem. The word Shechem means shoulder. It's, uh, the shoulder is the place where you bear a burden. Amen? You're going to carry something heavy, you put it on your shoulder. Joseph is, think about the picture of what it is that, that uh, the father's telling him to do. Joseph is leaving the fellowship of the father to go to a place that's going to be a heavy burden. When he arrived in Shechem, I can assure you he didn't go through and, and start telling everybody, hey, my daddy's Jacob. Uh, just want to look around, talk to somebody, look for my brothers. Anybody say? Uh, it wasn't something that was going to be a joy for him to go and explain. Why is that? Well, back in chapter number 34, there was this event that happened. 
the, the short term of the event is that uh, Joseph and the brothers, their sister was defiled by those of Shechem. The brothers had their revenge. They went through and killed every man in Shechem. Can you imagine Joseph rolling into town? Looking for my brothers. Let me tell you who they are. I know you're all excited. I didn't do that at all. Joseph left the father's house to go to a place that was destroyed in sin, covered up in hatred, still had carnage all around. All that said, Joseph didn't say when the father said, uh, I got a place for you to go. I got a job for you to do. He didn't say, eh, let me think about it. Let me, let me mull it over just a little bit. I'm, I'm sure that, hey, they're big boys. They'll be fine. He didn't say first of the week. If we hadn't heard from them, then I'll go. No, he was present. Hey, Amen. He said, here am I. You got a job. I'm going to be faithful to my father. As you start looking at the faithfulness of Joseph, you come to realize that faithfulness is not based on whether or not the task is easy. And it's not based on what other people think. And it's not based on, on whether or not you're going to be received and whether you're going to be loved and somebody's going to put your, your name on a plaque on the wall. It's the recognition of the Father's love and the Father's will. That's your motivation for going. Think of the willingness of Jesus to be able to leave heaven. All the glory and the splendor of heaven to be our sacrifice. He knew what it was that was waiting for him. He was going into a sin-cursed world, amen? A place where most of the people didn't really even appreciate him. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember? He, he knew exactly what it was that was about to be taking place. He knew that whenever he went to the cross that, that the wrath of God was going to be poured out upon him. He knew what the psalmist had, had described in great, uh, in, in great imagery. He knew everything that was going to uh, fall uh, befall him there and and remember, he made that wonderful statement. He says, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Uh, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Says, if it's possible, he said, uh, take this from me. Now, Jesus was not praying to get out of being the sacrifice. That's not what he was doing. So what was he doing? He was showing that us that there was absolutely no other way, right. no other way of our salvation than through him. Jesus told Pilate, he said, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Jesus was willing. Whenever the Lord gives us a task, you know, we should be just as willing. You ever think about the, uh, uh, one of the great forsaken matters of Christ-likeness is a willingness to do as the Word of God says. So, well, I want to have Christ-likeness in my life. Good. All it takes is obedience to the Word of God. Amen? Amen? God will Direct it just exactly the way it's supposed to be. There should be no hesitancy of God's people whenever the Word of God says to go forward. As we look around at the events of the day, we see all the things that are shaping up. Can I tell you, don't be absent. Don't be absent from where it is that, that God wants you to be. Be present. He's got a purpose for where you are. In this season, be present. Secondly, be diligent. Be diligent. Go down to verse number 15. It says, A certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed thence. And I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. Joseph was, was looking for those that were lost. Interesting, they didn't even know they were lost. Amen. <laughs> they, he was looking for them. He was wandering in the field. He was going back and forth. He was traversing that field. He was, uh, it, it would have been obvious they weren't there. Amen. You ever go in the field and look out there and say, well, there must be some people and sheep hid out around here. <laughs> you know? No, uh, he, he could have seen them. He would have known that they weren't present. Why in the world would he keep going over the field? Why would he be going back and forth? Why would he be wandering through? Why would he be looking? You know, uh, he could be looking for a lot of different things. But, but whenever you start thinking about sheep and the things that go on with the shepherd, he could be looking for blood. Amen. Was there a problem? Was there an attack? Was there something that caused uh, them to not be in the place that they were supposed to be? He could probably look and see where it was that they had been grazing, where they had fed. Uh, whether uh, the, 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 the grass was mowed down or whether it was still lush and, and be able to tell a little bit about where it was that they were going, looking for the trails that they left as they went out. He couldn't find them, but he didn't give up. Joseph didn't pick a good spot, lay down. I'm just going to lay down on the rock here for a little while and go back and tell Dad I couldn't find them. He was diligent. He didn't know where they were, but he still had a responsibility, Amen. 
He was still told that he was supposed to, to find that it would be unheard of to be able to have this commission that was given to him by his father and then go back empty handed and just say, well, just couldn't get any. Couldn't find anybody. There are times that we can find ourselves in that same kind of situation as Joseph. No real answers, no fruit, don't know. Amen. But if we will be diligent in the will of the Father, you know what God will do? He'll open you a door. Amen. Oh, if you'll just be diligent. You know, a lot of times we don't know what it is that God's doing. We don't know how it is that he's working. We don't see how something is going to come out for his good. Now, here's where we face the decision because we can trust in our own ability. We can trust in our own thoughts of whether we see something and then just say, well, it probably ain't going to work out. I'll just quit. Or we can just be faithful and see what God does. You know, if you'll be faithful, this is what God does. God works in people's lives who are faithful. If you'll be faithful to the things of God, you'll be amazed at how it is that he opens up a door of opportunity. You'll be amazed at how all of a sudden you, you didn't know what was taking place. You didn't know how things were going to happen. But now all of a sudden God in his glory and his, his blessing, he just says, I just want to show you something that I can do. He's not going to do it for somebody if you're not faithful. Why is that? You'll miss it. God will open a door, you'll walk right past it. If you're faithful, you're looking for the cause of Christ, you're looking to be able to honor God in your life, you're looking to be faithful in the midst of a, uh, of a place that's divided, ungodly, you just want to be able to stand for God, you'll be amazed at what it is whenever God says, I've got a purpose for you. A lot of times people talk about not knowing the purpose of God in their life. And that's right. Not faithful. Just be faithful. God will make that purpose known. Verse number 15, this man, he comes along with a great question. <clears throat> Look at it. He says, and a certain man found him. And behold, isn't that interesting right there? By the way, I love in Scripture, I love it, when there'll be just some random person walk by. Who's that? What's his name? I don't know. No idea. Just some guy. Think about this. God had the plan for that guy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Listen, he's, he's the watcher. He's just watching Joseph wandering around in a field. It's like, what's the deal with this guy? So he's going to go over and talk to him. Okay, verse number 15. A certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what seekest thou? I love that. Dude, what are you doing? What are you, what are you looking for? What seekest? To seek, it means to, to search, to search it out, to strive after. Now, I want you to think about that of Joseph's aspect right there. He was laboring in the field, wasn't he? He wasn't just glancing around. No, he went to the field. He was looking. Uh, he, had some, he had a purpose, and he was laboring in that field. He was striving after that purpose. And a certain man recognized that diligent pursuit. But then Joseph clarifies. He says, it's not a what. He says, what seeketh thou? He says, no, no, no. He says, we're not talking about a what, it's a, it's a who. Verse number 16, he says, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. I love that. See, uh, did they have a commodity? Sure they did. But the interest was not the commodity that they had. The interest was the people. In the time that we're in, when all eyes are looking to Israel and the interest is peaked on prophecy. Well, preacher, tell me something from the book of Revelation that goes along with this right here. I just want to know some good prophetic means. Why? If we're not going to be faithful in what it is that God tells us to do day in and day out, why do you want to know something about the book of Revelation? How about the, how about the gospel message that he's given to us? Amen. Listen, there's no reason to keep on looking. Keep on looking for something that, that, that God's got it taken care of. He says, this is what it is that I have you to do. Can I tell you, Joseph did not know what was going on in his life. We look at the book of Joseph. We, hey, we don't, he didn't have any idea the hardships he was going to have to go through. No clue whatsoever. He did not know that one day uh, by his strategy per se, by God's direction in his life, that he was able to store up food to be able to deliver the Egyptians as well as, as his whole family. And that everything that God said would come to pass to perfection. All he knew was he was going to be faithful in the field where God had him. He was interested in people. Man, all eyes are looking to Israel, looking to prophecy. Be diligent to keep your eyes focused on the great need of the souls of men. That's what it is that God desires. I think about Jesus whenever he was in Samaria. You remember he had talked to that Samaritan woman and she had gone back into town, remember? And 
And the disciples had gone into town. They were going to get something to eat. They came back and they, uh, they said, Lord, you want something to eat? And remember, he says, I have meat to eat that thou knowest not of. And, and they were looking around and said, did y'all give him something? Did he, somebody else come by and give him some food? He says, listen, he says, lift up your eyes and look on the field. Remember that woman? She goes into town. She says, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Man, the greatest soul winner was that woman right there. She didn't have time to get her, her home in order. She didn't go kick the boyfriend out that she was living with. She didn't have time to set things right, go to church, get, get a new set of clothes. She just went in and started talking about the very goodness of God, how he showed her all things that, that, that she had done in her life. She said, is not this the Christ? And, and all of a sudden there's a whole multitude of people coming out to Jesus and the disciples, those that are supposed to be the spiritual ones that have been walking with Jesus, all of a sudden, they're not even looking. He says, lift up your eyes. He says, there's a whole field laying out in front of you of people that need to be saved. That was the interest. It's on people. Oh, we can be diligent about any number of things, but none of them are more valuable than the soul of a person. We started basketball season for James's school. Had a meeting with the coach. <clears throat> it was a great meeting. I liked the coach. He was going through and he was explaining the, the general layout. He didn't talk about, well, we're going to work on this, that, and the other. He said, if you're disrespectful, you're going to run. Amen. He said, if you're late for practice, you're going to run. He said, if you're not passing your classes, you're going to sit on the bench, and then you are going to run. What was he doing? He was instilling the need of diligence. Amen. He said, this is going to be, this is what you signed up for. He said, your, your parents are paying good money for you to be able to be here. You're not going to take it lightly. He said, there should be diligence about what it is that we're doing. Can I tell you, the souls of man. Every single one of us, we're going to spend eternity somewhere. You don't just go in the grave and have a dirt nap. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. That's for all of eternity. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I don't want to imagine what that torment will be all about. Can I tell you, it's going to take the diligence of God's people to be able to recognize the souls of man before there'll ever be a change. It doesn't really matter just how much is going on in Israel. It doesn't really matter all of it. It doesn't matter if you know whenever Jesus is coming tomorrow or if he's coming 30 years from now. It does not change the fact that the souls of men are at stake. It doesn't matter what kind of car you drive. The souls of men prevails forever. Be present. Be diligent. Thirdly, be dependent. Be dependent upon God. Verse number 18, it says, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Can you imagine? Here it is. He's finally found the brethren. He's going out of his way. He's been working in the field. He's been laboring in the field. He finally found the place where they were supposed to be. And he goes out and he looks. And whenever he was still a great way off, they conspire against him, wanting him dead. Verse 20 says, come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. We will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of his hands and said, let us not kill him. Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he, talking about Reuben, that Reuben might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Reuben had at least a little bit of backbone to be able to say, hey, uh, now let's do it. Now, he should have been able to stand up and say, that ain't happening on my watch. No, nope. uh, we're taking the boy, we're, we're headed back to the house. But he said, well, at least he was trying to be kind of conniving, but, but work out for good. The brothers, they see Joseph that long way off, even before he came near. Can I tell you, Joseph didn't know what it was that they planned. But Think of what he's doing here. He's learning that God uh, knew where he was. He's, he's learning, this is all in his lesson, that God knew exactly how to keep him. Joseph likely didn't like the choice. Amen? As they're talking, uh, talking around him, it's like, hey, I know, let's kill him. No, no, let's throw him in the pit. Can you imagine being the, the pit is the good option? <laughs> Just pitch him in the pit. Sell him off as a slave. They didn't ask which one he preferred. All he was, all he was guilty of. Think of it. What did Joseph do that would either warrant him to be killed by his brothers or thrown into a pit and sold as a slave? 
What was he doing? He was faithful to the Word of God. He was faithful to the will of his Father. That was it. That's what he was doing. Joseph's brothers not only hated him and envied him, but they refused to believe what God said through him. That was the ultimate issue. In Joseph's dreams, he would be exalted. They would be bowing down. They didn't like the thought of that. And notice that's what they said there in verse number 20. He says, we shall see what shall become of his dreams. They didn't like the message. They didn't want to receive God's word concerning themselves. They'd, they'd prefer to ignore it. They'd prefer to insult the messenger. They wanted to justify themselves, justify their actions. Verse number uh, 27 Look at it, it says, come and uh, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh. Isn't that so nice of them? I mean, all of a sudden now they get to the point, they say, well, you know, he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. They said, that, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, they didn't want to own their own guilt. They decided it'd be more moral, more moral for them to sell him into slavery than to kill him. You know, that's kind of the way morality works. Amen? That's what morality is. It, it finds a, a couple of options, and it chooses the one that makes you look better. That's what it is. That's why a person can never be saved by their own morality, their own actions. Can I tell you, morality changes every generation. Uh, you can't look and be able to say, well, I'm more moral than the other person. It doesn't matter. We all fall short of the glory of God. That's where God's not looking for your goodness. He's not looking for your morality. He's looking for the righteousness to be able to get to heaven. That's that sinless perfection. That comes by receiving Jesus Christ. His righteousness has to be imparted to your account whenever you trust Christ as your personal Savior. Uh, that's whenever you're trusting the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. That was the, the complete work of God. Uh, morality chooses the lesser of the evils. And it can never be better than the righteousness that's required by God. So what was Joseph supposed to do with all that? He was to depend on the almighty hand of God to deliver him. That's what he was doing. Trusting God. Joseph had the word of God and that God would lift him up. How do we know that? That was his dreams. That was what it was that God gave to him. That was, that was God's word to him that he was going to be lifted up. He could trust the word of God. Uh, you know, amazingly enough, it didn't happen right then. Hey, Amen. Now, if you're like me, you want it to happen right then. God's plan always takes time. Amen? Takes some time. Just because Joseph had God's plan didn't mean that it was going to unfold overnight. Matter of fact, for the next 20 years of Joseph's life, uh, he would go through slavery. He would go through false accusations. He'd go through uh, betrayal, imprisonment. Uh, he would know discouragement and disappointment. He would have people that he thought had forsaken him. But through it all, he would learn that God is never out of control. He would learn that God's timing is absolutely perfect in all things. You may have uh, what it is that you consider a setback in your life. Hey man, you may be going through a trial, you may be looking and you're saying, you know, it, it seems like uh, things aren't going the way that they should, but God is looking to move forward the cause of Christ. It may be that you're having a hard time, it's just the pit stop, hey amen? That's what Joseph had, he had a little pit stop. <laughs> you might have a little pit stop yourself. The low places, those are the greatest opportunities to learn to trust God. Learn about His capability, learn about what is important. God knew where Joseph was all the time. Can I tell you, God knows exactly where you are. He knows where you are. In this day that we're in, with all of the events that's transpiring, can I tell you this? It is a great time to be alive. Amen. I mean, it is pretty awesome. I would definitely want to take an interest in God's hand and the things that are happening right now. We see the results, and oftentimes, man, we, we look at it, and we're like, oh, this is a horrible place, so ungodly. Yeah, it is. So divided. Yep, sure is. There are those that ignore the word of God, but God has given his people a commission to lift up our eyes, look on the field that's wide and ready into harvest. He wants us to be present, to be diligent, dependent upon him. Joseph spent a number of years not really knowing what God was up to. Never really knowing exactly what it was that was going on, and yet in the end, his faithfulness led to the saving of Egypt and the preserving of the children of Israel. As you look around in the events that are happening, don't downplay what it is that God has for you and me right now today. There is nothing more important than what it is of following through with the message that God has given to you and me. If you're here, you're not sure if you die today that you go to heaven. Can I tell you God's plan? He wants you to be saved. 
You know, we should be able to look at the events that are taking place around us and say, you know, it's exactly like God's word says. Oh, he could come back at any time if you're not ready to meet him. Can I tell you the greatest need that you have is to receive Christ. He wants you to come to the end of yourself. He wants you to trust in him alone. And he's looking for those today, believers on pews and in churches, listening to the word of God today. So what does he want from me? He just wants you to be faithful, faithful to his calling. He's looking for those that will say, here am I, here am I. Let's all stand together. Father, we want to thank you for your love and your blessings upon us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us an opportunity to gather around your word. I'm amazed at how much the things that transpired so long ago, so many times in the Old Testament, through the life of Joseph, Lord, it testifies of your goodness and, and your faithfulness. And Lord, it reminds us of how we're supposed to be faithful to your word as well. Help us, Lord, to always be willing to say, here am I. Lord, as you lay out your plan in our lives, I pray, Father, that you would have us to be willing Lord, help us to be able to look at the reality of the importance of souls that are all around us, those that need to know of Christ. Lord, I pray, Father, that you, your perfect will and way would be done. If there's one here that doesn't know for sure if they died today that they'd go to heaven, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, give them the courage to be able to come out and just say, I just need to, need to know of my eternal life. Lord, we don't know the amount of time that we have. That's, that's your department. But I do pray that you'd find us faithful. Help us, Lord, to honor you with our time and our life. Help us to be yielded to you. We want to thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 329. 329, if you need to come and pray, why don't you pray? Boy, what a great time to just commit your life to the Lord and ask him to direct your thoughts.